Too many clues, not enough suspects. This is PC McCann, Sunhill. Can you open the door, please? There's two wounds, one to the face and a crushed skull. We think that she was attacked, probably by somebody she knew. Is she going to be all right? I recommend looking for someone left-handed. The Bill, piecing together a puzzle in a Tuesday drama at 8 on Central. One good cop killed in the line of duty. Daddy had an accident. One good cop shouldering new responsibilities. You made me a legal guardian of his kid. I saw that. They're precious, aren't they? Starring Michael Keaton. Get a big house with enough room for kids. I'm working on getting this house to big house okay. up in the Bronx. But at what cost? What have you done, Artie? One good cop. Tuesday at 9 on Central. A devastating delivery takes team members by surprise in Outside Edge. Tuesday comedy on Central at 8.30 tomorrow. Demand more for your £11,465. The Primera Precision. Perfect comfort and fit that lasts all day. New Legacy from Pretty Polly. There's a holiday so large, so full, so exciting and so famous. To tell you all about it, we had to make a film. Walt Disney World's 43 square miles of sunny Florida. The film is free on video. Call 090 0 for the brand new 1996 copy and exclusive Unijet offers. It's a Walt Disney World of holidays in one. What's it like being old Grandpa? It's all about slowing down. Easy. But uh, you still need an appetite for life. With his ketchup? <laughs> Commercial Union for pensions for life. We won't make a drama out of a crisis. You could get full market value for your present house through our house exchange service. Ring Barrett on 0345 62 63 64. Factory XS sale now on. Top brand names from Danny Mac, Woolsey, James Barry, French Connection, Jersey Masters, Telemac and many more. The Factory XS sale at Lee Circle, Leicester. They're an elite team fighting the toughest criminals. They're only coppers. Wrong. They're thief takers. Starting soon on Central. Now on Central, it's news time. News at 10 with Trevor MacDonald. Bloodshed in the battle for the Chechen hostage village. Women in chains, prison chief orders a review. New doctor shortage threatens casualty units. And the army's invitation to you to join the SAS. Good evening. President Yeltsin ordered his troops into action today in the Russian hostage crisis down on the Chechen border. They went in, guns blazing, 16 hours ago, but again and again they've been fought off by the Chechens. There have undoubtedly been casualties on all sides, though it's impossible to establish any details. The Chechens say nine hostages died in the Russian attacks. The Russians claim to have got nine out safely. ITN's Julian Mannion was there throughout the battle today. 
The attack began at around 9 a.m. local time. Russian helicopter gunships blasted the outskirts of the village. Explosions could be seen among the houses, and smoke started rising from buildings set on fire. The helicopters dropped flares to deflect anti-aircraft missiles, and Russian combat troops ran forward to take up their assault positions. When we got close to the village on foot, the troops tried to keep us away from the scene. Russian soldiers are still fighting for the edge of the village of Perfomaiskaya, well over an hour after the attack began. And the soldiers on the other side of this ditch here are becoming extremely angry at our presence. They've fired warning shots to make us go away, and they're now calling to the authorities further back to take us out. But we stayed and saw the Russian troops using machine guns and mortars to try and dislodge Chechen rebels from houses on the fringe of the village. Somewhere inside those houses were pockets of rebels holding small groups of hostages. But the Russians were unable to cross the open ground between because of the Chechen fire that continued in spite of the bombardment. The helicopters fired again. Russia's interior ministry has claimed that no houses containing hostages have been set ablaze in the attack. But on the southern side of the village where we were, the damage seemed widespread and often indiscriminate. A spokesman for the Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, says that he authorized the assault because he believed that any further delay would threaten the lives of the hostages. But it is difficult to see how this operation can ensure their safety. The Russian government says that the final order for the attack was given after the Chechens fired on Russian negotiators and began shooting the hostages. The Chechen rebel leader, General Dudayev, has dismissed this statement as a crude lie. Relatives of the civilian hostages gathered near the scene, many in obvious distress. A statement this evening by the Russian government said that their troops have so far managed to free nine of the hostages. Fighting is still going on with journalists kept well back. The Russians say they are inside the village, but the Chechens are still putting up fierce resistance. And shells apparently fired by the Chechens have now landed in the village where we are based, just down the road from Pervomaiskoye. Residents are now fleeing this area in panic. Julian Mannion, News at 10 on the Chechen-Dagestan border. Sending in the troops today was a big gamble for President Yeltsin, but another climb down was politically unthinkable. He said today Chechen terrorism had to be uprooted. For the view from Moscow, here's our diplomatic editor, James Mates. The Russian people have watched every moment of this crisis unfold on television. They have watched Russian troops storm a village with little apparent thought for Russian hostages. And yet many have been pleased to see action taken against Chechens, who in the past had seemed able to strike with impunity. Boris Yeltsin, desperate to restore his authority, said there could be no compromise with terrorists. We are a powerful state, he said, and we can't tolerate the presence of armed bandits on our territory. We have to do away with them. He was not going to repeat the mistake of last summer when a Chechen gang seized and murdered hostages, only to be given buses to drive to freedom. Inevitably, they soon tried again. But Yeltsin's real problem is that a war that was supposed to last weeks is now in its second year, and with every crisis, every siege, the Chechen guerrillas inflict further damage on his administration. In the Russian parliament, his government is likely to be challenged in a new vote of confidence. The communists and the hardline nationalists now have a parliamentary majority and will take their seats there tomorrow. And those who once defended Yeltsin, the Democrats, now denounce him. This is a shame of Russia. This is a shame of Russian uh, president. This is the shame of Russian democracy, and that shows how far is Russia from democracy and real human rights. The only major figure still supporting Yeltsin over Chechnya is the ultra-right-wing nationalist Vladimir Zhirinovsky. A sure sign the policy has gone horribly wrong. In the 13 months since it began, the Chechen war has done terrible damage to Russia's reputation abroad and to Russian democracy at home. It has discredited President Yeltsin's claim to stand for good government and respect for human rights. He ordered the troops in. At the presidential election in just five months' time, he could pay the price for that decision. James Mates, News at 10, Moscow. 
Here, the official policy of keeping pregnant women prisoners in handcuffs and chains is to be reversed. The acting head of the prison service said today he and the Royal College of Midwives were looking for a more sensible arrangement. The prison's minister had to apologise unreservedly for misleading MPs about one such case last week. Our political correspondent Hugh Pym reports. These pictures shown first on ITN's Channel 4 News sparked a public outcry. They show a woman just after giving birth chained to a prison officer as they leave the delivery room. Friends say she was also handcuffed an hour before having the baby. After meeting midwives leaders today, prison chiefs said procedures would be changed. The Royal College and I have agreed to try and, between us, draft satisfactory guidelines that will lead to a change and to a, a, a more sensible arrangement that both sides are happy with. Our plan is that for a prisoner giving birth or being in labour, it is not acceptable for them to be in handcuffs. It is not acceptable for them, for them to have prison officers in the same room that they're in. Changes which come none too soon, according to Labour. I will welcome any change in this grotesque and savage policy whenever it comes, but it is a sad commentary on both the incompetence and heartlessness of Conservative Home Office ministers that it's taken this kind of scandal to get any change. All this as the prison's minister admitted a London hospital had complained about the treatment of prisoners in labour last year, contrary to what she told the Commons last week. I deeply regret that the advice which I had been given about this correspondence and which I in turn gave to the House in all good faith was wrong. And I offer, Madam Speaker, my unreserved apologies to the House. Ministers have been defending the existing policy because of concern about escapes during hospital visits. But they are now set to announce changes which will probably only allow the handcuffing of prisoners in the earlier stages of pregnancy. Hugh Pym, News at 10, Westminster. ITN has seen an unpublished survey tonight which points to a crisis in the hospital accident and emergency units next month. That's when junior doctors swap their specialities. One in three of the posts and casualty were still not filled at the end of the year. Hospitals can't get the staff even when they increasingly recruit abroad. Our health correspondent Anya Sitharam reports. The casualty department at Rotherham General Hospital is preparing to face unprecedented shortages. In two weeks' time, its eight junior doctors' posts become vacant. So far, only three have been filled, all appointments from overseas. The hospital is now offering what it calls inflated salaries to entice applicants. There may be reduced numbers of staff on at particular times, especially perhaps at weekends. Therefore, those patients who are coming with minor conditions, I expect they're going to be waiting longer and possibly for some considerable time. An unpublished survey carried out for the British Association of Accident and Emergency Medicine found that at the end of December, 500 out of 1,500 junior doctors' posts, which become vacant in February, were unfilled. The survey looked at over 200 hospitals across Britain. In the February intake in 1995, there was a 13% shortage nationally. I suspect from the figures that I've got that it's going to be a bit greater than that this year, maybe 20%. But Changes in training mean juniors no longer have to work in casualty. More posts have been created since their hours were cut, but there just aren't enough doctors to go round. The whole host of ways that they can cope, but I suspect there are going to be some that are going to have to restrict their hours of opening. Last week, ministers intervened to ease the shortage by announcing hospitals can recruit more permanent staff if necessary. But while that may help out in the future, doctors say it'll do little to ease the immediate crisis. Doctors say patients who are seriously ill will be treated promptly, but many who attend casualty departments could be faced with unacceptably long waits. Anya Sitharam, News at 10. After weeks of speculation, the ailing Greek Prime Minister Andreas Papandreou resigned tonight. He spent the last two months on a life support machine, suffering from pneumonia and kidney failure. In a resignation letter, Papandreou, who is 76, said, It's obvious the country cannot remain incapacitated by my illness. The ruling Socialist Party will elect a successor at the weekend. Bosnia was to have seen a big exchange of prisoners between the rival armies today, but it came to nothing. The Bosnian government accepted much of the responsibility. It said it was refusing to return Bosnian Serb prisoners until the Bosnian Serbs have accounted for all the missing Muslims. ITN's Paul Davies reports from Bosnia. It was to have been another spectacular step towards achieving the Dayton Peace Agreement. 
British troops, backed by their Challenger battle tanks, surrounded a checkpoint on the old confrontation line, colourfully known as Black Dog, expecting to see the simultaneous release of the remaining prisoners held by the Bosnian Serb and Croat forces. RAF helicopters flew in generals and other dignitaries to witness the event, and when coaches arrived to transport the expected 400-plus released prisoners back to their families, all looked well. But the hours passed until word finally came through that the release had been called off. The detainees had been taken back to prison. The army of Bosnia and Herzegovina did neither transfer nor release any prisoner here in Kopaci. Uh, as a consequence, then, the Serb side decided so far uh, not to release the person they have in their, uh, under their power. While today's experience is being seen as a setback, the rival armies still have until Friday's deadline to free their prisoners. Causing most concern tonight is the Bosnian government's refusal to release any captured Serb until the Serbs account for thousands of Muslims still allegedly missing following the fall of Srebrenica. Paul Davis, News at 10, Northern Bosnia. Still ahead on News at 10 tonight, why thousands of miners are set to get compensation for a crippling disease. How I fell out with England's cricket bosses by fast bowler Devon Malcolm. And the biotech revolution that means your pizza might never be the same again. This looks like tomato puree, it even tastes like tomato puree, but this was conceived in the laboratory. You think you've seen it all, and what happens? Up pops a new Rover 100 Kensington SE. With stylish interior trim, radio cassette, and now free insurance, it's got to be worth a second look. The new 100 Kensington SE. Above all, it's a Rover. TCP is anaesthetic and antiseptic, so if you gargle with it, it can help ease colds, soothe sore throats, and stop you being hoarse. Meet my friend, Poonam. Home pride, low in fat, creamy curry sauce. Thick and creamy, just like it should be. But it's low in fat. That's right, low in fat. Curry and rice, top scram. As we say up here in Liverpool, eat up, you're at your aunties. Home pride low in fat sauces. Authentic flavours from all around the world. Also available in Liverpool. This is the future of corporate computing. No, wait a minute. This is. Oops, sorry, scrap that. The future is definitely this. On second thoughts, perhaps the future is this, we think. There are a lot of visions of the future. Most will turn out not to be right. But we're working to make sure you can't go wrong. We engineer network systems and solutions that help you anticipate the uncertainty ahead, so that no matter which way the future goes, you'll have chosen correctly. Digital, whatever it takes. Many scientists are convinced that some adult diseases are predetermined by our genetic makeup. Does this mean we can avoid such diseases by genetic engineering? And even if we can, should we? An important investigation into genetic research launches a major new health section every Tuesday only in the Daily Express. If British Gas installs central heating or replace your boiler now, you only have to pay a 5% deposit and not a penny more for six months. So call 0345 450 450 now. Welcome back. 
A judge gave miners and former miners the go-ahead today to seek compensation from British coal for an industrial disease called vibration white finger. Its symptoms are numbness and the trembling of the hands. The case could cost British coal millions. Here's our North of England correspondent Steve Scott. Alan Ibbotson was a miner for 30 years. The legacy he carries from a career at the coalface is vibration white finger, or VWF, an incurable condition leading to numbness and loss of strength in the hands. My feet get cold in the cold weather, but they don't go white. Like my fingers do. You could, put, you could nearly cut them off with that anaesthetic. It gets that bad. VWF, which affects the circulation and nerves, is caused by continued exposure to vibration. Many miners working in the pits used handheld power drills or pneumatic picks day in, day out. Some didn't report their symptoms, mistakenly blaming cold working conditions. Today in Newcastle, in a test case involving several former pitmen, a judge ruled there was evidence of health risks in 1975 and British coal should have put preventative steps in place, including warnings and routine examinations. It is absolutely marvellous which we are getting into deer. I think it's brilliant. Just for the lads, that's going to follow you on and claim. It's absolutely great. Not only these plaintiffs, but potentially thousands of local people can now pursue claims for compensation against British coal. Um, the immediate effect is that these uh, nine lead actions will be brought on to uh, trial at a, a later date to determine what levels of compensation these plaintiffs would be entitled to. British Coal tonight facing a bill running into tens of millions of pounds said they would not comment until they'd considered the implications of the judgment in full. Steve Scott, News at 10. Some schools were accused today of not doing enough to teach children right from wrong. Dr Nick Tate, who's the government's chief curriculum advisor, said a new national code of conduct, a sort of ten commandments for the late 20th century, might help. Here's a Home Affairs correspondent, Harry Smith. According to Dr. Tate, many schools find it difficult to teach the difference between right and wrong because society no longer believes in laying down strict codes of behavior. Previous societies had all sorts of pithy sayings and rules and things like the Ten Commandments, which gave people a, a common everyday language with which they could talk about moral things, gave them a moral code to aspire to, even if they often fell short of it. We lack that kind of language today, partly because of the decline of religion, and one of the things that we're exploring this conference is the extent to which there is a consensus. He doesn't say exactly what should be in the new Ten Commandments, but they're likely to include such things as honesty, respect for others, and politeness. An old-fashioned sense of fair play, forgiveness, punctuality, and non-violent behavior. And personal virtues such as patience, faithfulness, and self-discipline. All are values which many schools already promote. At this school in the Midlands, which has its own code of conduct, there's already a strong sense of right and wrong. Helping each other, being caring, being generous, being sharing things with other people, and um, like caring for them. Right is helping people, caring for people, and doing well and good. And wrong is bullying, vandalising things, and reducing other people's opportunities. At the nearby teacher training college, they can see some benefit in a national code. Very helpful because it obviously gives you a guideline as a teacher and also gives the children guideline. Dr Tate wants the new code to be drawn up in consultation with the churches and business and community leaders to ensure it has the widest possible support. Harry Smith, News at 10. The health service was severely criticised today in a new report on a series of killings and suicides by the mentally ill. The Royal College of Psychiatrists' inquiry concluded that the government had failed to provide proper care. It said overcrowded wards, unsuitable fellow inmates and overworked staff were driving patients away from treatment. The building industry warned today that 20,000 jobs would go by Easter because of a lack of new orders. The bleak forecast coincided with the Treasury Committee report which said the government's upbeat predictions about the economy were unconvincing. And demonstrators against the Newbury Bypass in Berkshire clashed with security guards again today. Twenty people were arrested. The contractors managed to cut down some trees to prepare for the new road, but yet again they were forced to stop work. Genetic engineers are apparently about to revolutionize our diets. They have created tomato puree that started life in the laboratory and will soon go on sale at Safeway and Sainsbury's. The British firm Zeneca are behind the development and more tinkering with the genes of plants is underway. 
For tonight's special report, David Rose has been investigating. This is genetic engineering. A compressed air gun is loaded with tungsten bullets coated with DNA. If this experiment is successful, the result may be a brand new strain of mushroom. Now the scientists hope a few genes will have changed. Before the firing, this is what a section of mushroom tissue looked like. Afterwards, it's peppered with tungsten pellets and foreign DNA. What we're talking about here really is only a uh, progression from the conventional hybridization and selection procedures which plant breeders have successfully been employing for years. But of course we have here a very much more precise technology, something which can be targeted very uh, carefully on the gene of particular interest. Thank you. Well, it looks like ordinary tomato puree on this pizza. It even tastes like ordinary tomato puree. But this is very special stuff, because this will be the first true genetically engineered food to go on sale in Europe. And experts believe if the public do accept this next month, the floodgates will open. The new tomatoes the puree comes from have been engineered in Zeneca's laboratories. They now take longer to rot, and that means big savings. We use less water in irrigation, we're wasting less as it's transported to the factory, and there are higher yields of paste at the end. All of that is saving a lot of energy, which ought to be important as we get into the next century. Making these tomatoes age more slowly is easy, compared with improving flavor or changing shape, but the genetic engineers are tackling both. Round tomatoes are so inefficient, square ones will pack much more easily. And they're trying to straighten out the banana's infuriating curve. As for pineapples, nice fruit, shame about the skin, but that's on the way out too. 60 pence a pound tomatoes. Like Prince Charles, some food experts are profoundly unimpressed by this British breakthrough of tomato puree and by the impending genetic engineering revolution. History has taught us that if foods go off, they're bad to eat. Those rules are now going to be turned upside down by the revolution. Uh, and what will happen is a food like this tomato uh, might look wonderful, but how long has it been on the shelf? How many vitamins and nutrients are left in it? And frankly, it's ludicrous. Consumers aren't demanding this revolution. They're just going to get it. What do you think about the idea of genetically engineered fruit and vegetables? Well, to be honest with you, I don't think it's a natural thing to do. Start messing around with nature. This experimental brewery has made the world's first beer to come from a genetically modified yeast, offering breweries huge savings. But so far, none has taken it up. I'm sure in the future we'll be able to get beers that with different flavours, beers that can be made in, in cheaper ways. So I'm sure that inevitably this type of technology will be employed. Millions have already been spent on genetically modifying food like mushrooms, but the companies haven't tried to market them yet because they're intensely nervous about the public's reaction. They'll be watching how the tomato puree sells very, very closely. David Rose, News at 10, Warwickshire. Cricket, the Test and County Cricket Board has stepped into the row about the way the England fast bowler Devon Malcolm was treated in South Africa. Malcolm claims he was publicly humiliated by the England team management under Ray Illingworth and was quoted as saying today that it may have had something to do with his colour. At Ian's Peter Staunton reports. Devon Malcolm went on tour full of optimism. A year earlier he destroyed the South Africans single-handed at the Oval. Nine wickets in a day, one of the greatest fast bowling performances in history. Yet in the minds of the England hierarchy, there were still doubts about his temperament. And those doubts surfaced as the team prepared for battle. At the centre of some vitriolic and very public criticism was the manager, Ray Illingworth. Malcolm's intelligence was called into question. He was a cricket non-entity, he said. But today he hit back with a broadside of his own against the management's efforts to G him up. Cheer up what? I mean, comments like that would jerry up? No, it doesn't jerry me up at all, you know? I mean, that's patronising to say, um, come in and say things like, I have got no cricket brains, non-entity. I've taken over 100 wickets for England, you know? So, um, <laughs> people can't just go around belittling things like that. Every game I play for England, I love it. In South Africa, Malcolm had one decent game, got dropped and came in for some punishment when recalled. His attempts to play the race card today, asking whether he'd have suffered the same criticism if he'd been white, will mean certain punishment. Peter Staunton, News at 10.
The main headline again tonight, President Yeltsin ordered his troops into action today in the Russian hostage crisis on the Chechen border. But they were held back by the rebels holding about 200 hostages. And finally, if you're looking for a part-time job, why not try the SAS? This most elite of fighting forces is under strength and looking for recruits. Our defence correspondent Penny Marshall reports. There was a time when the SAS seemed invincible. Heroes only need apply. They came from nowhere to storm the Iranian embassy, only to disappear again into the shadows. Then they were shrouded in mystery, but that was before the SAS books, videos, interviews, and now the SAS recruitment campaign. Are you man enough to join the SAS Territorial Army? Or so asked the current edition of Soldier magazine, which reveals that the SAS's two part-time regiments are looking for crack recruits. Your SASTA needs you, so to speak. If you're interested, you can call. Hello, this is the SAS Volunteers. The address to write to is... Chances of a civilian getting into the SAS, probably around, with no mil previous military experience, 1,000 to 1, uh, demands a level of commitment, willpower and, and, and self-discipline that is beyond most people. So is the army just using the SAS to attract reservists to cure a manpower shortage? Maybe, although a dustman, lorry driver and a surgeon have already dared to join. Certainly, though, any couch potatoes need not apply. Penny Marshall, News at 10. Rules us out. That's News at 10 tonight. We're back tomorrow. From the entire team here at ITN, good night. And good evening. Well, we still have very mild air across much of the country at the moment, but it is going to bring a lot of fog and mist with it overnight, and that is going to be slow to clear tomorrow. The Met Office wind flow chart shows a weak weather front to the west of us. Now, that's maintaining these southerly winds, which is blowing the mild but moist air across the country. By the end of the week, though, that weather front will be edging across the country, bringing cloud and rain to the west. Well, over in the east, that high pressure there maintains its dominance. Tonight, then, we're going to find rain and drizzle in the far northwest, while elsewhere, night winds will allow mist and fog to thicken, turning quite dense in some places by the morning. Tomorrow it's going to be a dull, grey and murky start for most of us. We still have that rain and drizzle in the far northwest, and through the day that's going to edge southwards, covering much of Scotland and bringing drizzle into Northern Ireland by the end of the day. Elsewhere though, staying mostly dry with some brighter spots in places, while parts of the east though will stay misty all day long. On to temperatures, and once again it's going to feel particularly mild in the brighter spots, as high as 12 Celsius in the south West, that's 54 Fahrenheit. One or two degrees cooler than that, though, in the duller areas. That's all from me. Here's a summary. Sponsored by PowerJet. Producing electricity, whatever the weather. <laughs>